name's Skip Mitz, and in 2014, I joined John Shul at RIT in his lab. Um, it was only like six months after they, he and his students came up with the RIT arm. And so everything that I've done along with him since then kind of grew out of that. Um, we have been making arms recently, but prior to getting back into arms, we were uh, just doing terminal devices. And we were looking at this device, the familiar Hosmer hook. Uh, and I can't think of the name of the original inventor, but it's over 100 years old. And it's still very popular because it's so effective. They can do just anything with it. And being the hook, they can even see, if you're trying to pick something up and you only have one posture for your hand to do it, you're going to be blocking your vision for what you're trying to pick up. And with something as skimpy as a hook, you can see what you're going for. You know, and so there's a lot of advantages of this. And it's usually shoulder powered. There's a Bowden cable that connects to the lever. And you shrug your shoulders and it voluntarily opens. So we did that. And uh, the problem we found was it's kind of ugly. <laughs> And uh, so we, we, we basically wanted the same thing with uh, one moving part and a rubber band to close it. And you could pull on a Bowden cable like the RIT arm, could be elbow powered, or it could be shoulder powered and voluntary opening. And when you pick something up, you don't have to keep exerting your uh, muscles. The rubber band holds it for you and carries it around. So it's, it's uh, the advantage of the voluntary opening and so we call this the gripper and if you look google the gripper matures you'll find a blog post that will tell the two-year history of that developing um, and more recently in addition to the terminal device we've started working on arms and the technology that we've been developing for arms we call adjusto wrap so google adjusto wrap <laughs> and you'll find another blog post that uh, is the follow-up to the Gripper Matures. And what we're doing is using uh, we're using uh, a laminator, like you'd make menus or uh, laminated cards. And you print the design you want on your device on uh, plain paper with a laser printer and it could be intended to match skin color or it could have uh, designs for superheroes soccer players what you know whatever you want could be printed on paper then you laminate it in the mylar film use uh, five mil uh, laminating pack packets rather than the three mil because the heavier is better and then you can roll it up, tape it together, and you make uh, an actually a pretty strong arm. You can make it as many layers thick as you want it. And uh, the uh, going back to the terminal device, we started out with the body-powered voluntary opening device with the Bowden cable, like the elbow power. And uh, I was I was showing John Schul my latest idea on a Saturday lunch, and uh, I forgot to bring the cable. And so anyway, we picked up his beverage bottle and stuck it into the hand and said, whoa, we don't need the cable. <laughs> so a lot of our discoveries were discoveries, not inventions. And we, we decided that that's, that's value, and it's proved out to have value uh, for the users to not have to mess with the harness and the cable, just to have what we call a passive prehensor. So if you want to grip something, you just put it into the grip with your other hand. And you can do two-handed tasks, like put a nut on a screw, or open a jar and make your peanut butter crackers. You know, uh, two-handed tasks like cutting your food. And you know, no strings attached. So the uh, the gripper thumb hand 
has been evolving for us now. And one process has told me early in the game, hey, I didn't like that. You gotta be able to, uh, to get a soda bottle or a soda can into the grip or I'm not gonna use it. So the thumb is still a little bit funny shaped because we wanna be able to pick up small things. Not that small in that orientation, but you know, in some orientation and large things like this. I, I go for like 77 millimeters and down to uh, 25 millimeters in, in this grip. And, and so that's, that's my criteria. Uh, when we're making very small ones, however, that won't, that won't go around the bottle that big. And that would be a funny looking hand. But anyway, so we've got terminal devices and they attach to the prosthesis, the socket, the same way uh, uh, the conventional prosthetic terminal devices do with a, a screw uh, that's a 20, uh, 20 threads per inch, half, half inch uh, machine screw. And so that's the industry standard for prosthetists. And we make our terminal devices with the same kind of connector. So you can substitute one of these for one of these and vice versa. So the latest development was to make the arms out of this uh, adjusto wrap material. And just within the past week, we've got a really late breaking news. We're using soda bottles. And uh, take a bottle like this, I, for this size arm I'm using, this was made with uh, uh, one liter bottles, two of them, and a heat gun, you know, the regular, like this, to uh, shrink it down. And uh, we put a uh, ring in the center here. So when you put the two ends together, it's got something to support it. Oh, here's a ring. So I'd shrink that on down and with the drill, put some pegs made out of filament. Just take the same filament, same color that you've been printing with, drill a hole, uh, put a head on, on the little pig with a soldering iron and poke it in the hole. You can mash it down flat with, uh, with the soldering iron. And then you put the other one on it and you end up with something like this and you can pass it around. But uh, that's, that's part of it. This, uh, heat shrunk PET bottles, uh, that's polyethylene terephthalate, not PETG like we print with, but uh, it seems to want to shrink, shrink when you heat it up with a heat gun. I'm not sure what's going on. I read about the process that they manufacture them. They actually uh, use a, uh, injection molding to print, I mean to uh, mold a tube with the uh, screw threads on the end of it. And then they screw the threads into the machine and put it inside of a, a, a mold cavity and heat it up and then pump air into it and it puffs out to, to conform to the shape of the mold. And that's how they make the bottles. But it's apparently the case that when you heat it up again, it tries to go back to its original small shape that it was molded in. And so, you know, that big liter sized bottle gets this, this small, and that's real strong. I'll let you pass it around and play with it, but I'll show you another feature of this arm. It has a nice little elbow, and again, like the gripper thumb, uh, the elbow would be operated by your other hand. So you can change the position by pulling the, uh, the little lever, and it locks into place in several positions. So you can have a bent up elbow or not. So you can pass that around and take a look at, at how the adjusto wrap and the gripper thumb will take something to grip. So I know your, your bottles are a very, very new discovery. Are you going to make a ring at the top and the bottom so that you can still cover it uh, with the adjusto wrap? Yep. So decorate it? 
So there it is. This is what a finished one looks like. This is for a transradial, you know, elbow down. And uh, our intern this summer uh, was a third year O&P student from uh, studying in Scotland. And they scanned uh, the 35-year-old uh, man's residual limb. He, he lost his, his arm about a, a year and a half ago. And, uh, you know, where's that potato-looking thing? Here. Uh, no, <laughs> he just printed this uh, this week with his new printer. Is that a, a, a CR10 printer? The yeah, new one? With a one millimeter nozzle. With a one millimeter nozzle. And he printed this with uh, uh, one, two hours with a one millimeter nozzle. Uh, and it's it's pretty nice. And pass that around. I'm really pleased with that. This, are those castration bands in the foam? Uh, could be. And we switched to using this material. So here's the castration band. And we were using that. And it's also latex. So somebody was pointing out this morning that a lot of people are allergic to latex. We've got we to make sure that everybody knows that's what we're using when we use it. Oops. But uh, you can snip off a piece of this, what I call slingshot material. It's uh, surgical tubing you can get from Lowe's or Home Depot or most any hardware store and uh, it's very, very stretchy. So you can just cut off, you know, quarter inch, whoops, piece of that. And, uh, and, and it holds the thumb with uh, zip ties. And this has the bottle in it too. I'm not gonna take it apart, but you can, you can take the one apart. Get you. So I wonder um, if you're getting any difference, I mean, going through different kind of mechanisms for that elasticity. Are you getting different kinds of tension or pressure or forces or something? Yeah, you can get what you want. So just like with this, you see some macho guys doing heavy heavy labor, they'll put six six of these bands on here. That's fairly yeah. common. Right. You know, and you've got real strong shoulder muscles to pull it with, but you can do chin-ups and whatever on the monkey bars. Uh, you can stack up these things on this device too. They, that's where I learned about the castration bands. They were already using them on the Hosma hooks. Some people were, and uh, but I liked I like this. It's easier to come by, and you don't have to say castration. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of ironic a little, you know, which I kind of like. But um, I, I think that's something really cool. Um, definitely makes me think of the shaft test that we're about to bring into this clinical trial because literally one of the objects in there is a screw top lid. Oh yeah, um, yeah. You know, the, a nut and bolt. Yeah, the nut and bolt screwing. Uh, was another one. A pencil. You want to be able to write. Yeah, dexterity, I think, is another big thing, too, and that fine control of things. I, I, you I know, even small nut and bolts you can do. In terms of, like, training for things to write, is that something also you consider, you know, as, as far as, like, they're putting a marker or a pencil in there, and maybe, they have, you know, after a while, they, they get better handwriting? Have you seen anything like that? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was distracted. So, yeah. No. Um, so you got a lot of funny. So um, you know, where, where I'm specifically like the, the marker or pencil or pen um, for writing, have you been able to notice or see anyone using that long enough to sh see any difference in their writing ability? Yeah. Well, we we're uh, our lab's doing research and development, and we call our recipients test pilots instead of recipients. So we're we're we're, we're developing new things that don't have the bugs out of them yet and we're using the test pilots to help us work kinks out and uh, we don't have that much data on that many different users for most of these things and it's it, it keeps evolving um, one thing I know um, even from my own perspective listening to a lot of engineers in my own thesis for something completely different as you know it's good to stick with one iteration and maybe it's feedback I don't know but I've been told by several people sticking with one iteration and just kind of maximizing the amount of data that we can get before moving to the next. But I know mm -hmm. it's very, it seems probably very anecdotal or having that ability to have the user kind of tell you directly and get that feedback. Yeah, and um, I probably got uh, several hundred, hundred iterations in Tinkercad on, on the gripper thumb hand. And that's something like a process, especially, or like, oh, I see you have like, 
it's something we have to kind of tell them, like, like basically anecdotally, you know, when, when yeah. they've been asking to do a more specific thing, which is something they do in their own practice. So relating it back to them in that way. And I know you've worked with the OP as well. And right. So the two-handed task can include tying your shoes, zipping your jacket, uh, feeding yourself, putting toothpaste to on your toothbrush, and uh, you know all kinds of things like that. You you want it to be uh, washable uh, because sanitation is important if you're eating with the device on. So uh, you know if you've got all of these joints to try to clean the dirt out between the joints and stuff like that, it might be trickier than what we ultimately hope to get to. You can put a, a rubber glove on the gripper thumb. It's not easy to get it on there with I was, the thumb I was and all. But raptor in the lab, literally for pipetic. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's, and... <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's hard to get the glove on there, but there's spaces between the fingers so yeah. you can do that, and that's desirable. Uh, so our friends in India are doing that. They've got the special rubber gloves, skin colored, that they'll use. And oh, by the way, in many parts of the world, the cosmesis, the appearance, not to draw attention to the person using it is very important. That's important in Haiti, uh, in Africa, in India. They don't want to draw attention to themselves out in public. And so the more realistic it looks, the better. There's a, a, a phenomenon called the uncanny, uncanny valley. Are you familiar with that? If things look sort of like a human hand, but a little bit off, it's like worse than being way off and looking like a robot hand. You know, it's like looks creepy. And so you gotta be careful that you don't don't look creepy trying to look like a human hand. Yes, sir. Scaling the hand, do you have to scale it at all? I, I, I think there is. Excellent, excellent question. And I'm using Tinkercad, and it's not uh, parametric. So everyone that I redesign, you can't just scale it in the slicer because you're making this fit into here. And if I enlarge this, it wouldn't fit the bolt anymore. So you, in Tinkercad, you have to take it apart, enlarge the parts you want to enlarge, and then put it back together, which is not that big a deal. And we are using four sizes for the whole range of human hands. Um, this is for an elementary school child. And uh, I, I just measure across the knuckles. And the ones that are going around are for an adult female teenager. Uh, and then there's one size larger for an adult male. And there's one size smaller for preschoolers. So the four sizes, left and right, you still got eight designs to mess with, uh, but uh, that's that's where we are now. And so I, I wanted to give you a little more information about how that adjuster wrap goes together. Where's the, the one with the elbow? There. Yeah, I want that one. <laughs> So whether you're using the bottles or just the adjusto wrap, you can uh, you can put one layer between the socket and the next device that you're connecting together. Uh, actually, I usually uh, do it this way. I just do a little demonstration. I use the famous blue tape. You squeeze it together and you, you, you use a piece of cardboard like a file folder or something and you work out the shape and the size of what you're going to wrap around. And you tuck it in, there's a little slot to make with the adjuster wrap film. Hold it with a piece of blue tape, take regular uh, postal tape, oh, which I've lost the end of. But uh, it turns out that this stuff sticks very well to the mylar. If I can find the end of it. I hate it when that happens. Maybe it's a Mobius strip. I think it is. <laughs>
scotch tape and the wider makes me feel more comfortable that it's sturdy. Take off the uh, blue tape and take the rest of the seam and you can put padding inside if it's uh, fitting over the residual arm like a socket. Uh, and, uh, neoprene sticky back tape you can get from Amazon or you know maybe even if, uh, if you're just experimenting you could use uh, weather stripping tape foam. And so you, you get one layer uh, of clear and you can see if the foam is fitting the contours of the arm you can use it like a check socket the prosthetist will use a clear check socket and then you can put your ornamental layer on top of that and it can be pretty strong you can make as many layers as you need to to feel comfortable that it's strong enough but if you put the bones made out of bottles inside there it's really pretty strong and you can match the skin color when you're matching colors by the way um, there's several levels of quality of color matching. Uh, a C level match, what we call, is if you're like a half a meter apart, this arm being the same color as this arm, uh, it doesn't have to be perfectly precise. This finger being two centimeters away from that finger, that would, you would notice it if it weren't more precise. And if they're touching, if they're juxtaposed, that's a level match and that's really got to be good so if you're trying to match the forearm with the elbow with the hand you know that's not a good match and I'm colorblind <laughs> so I'm more sensitive to, to value rather than hue but uh, you know this printed thing wants to match uh, or the adjusto wrap wants to match the 3d printed made in part with an a level match and we worked out a procedure so that you can hold a uh, printout a chart on your laser printer and pick the color that matches as best you can and then print out a whole page and laminate it. And if, you, the, if you're fussy enough. The color picker that I saw it come up. Pardon me? The color picker. I think that's yeah, the yeah. John that posted. That's it. Yeah. You got it. So you've been looking at our stuff. Oh, yeah. And that's, uh, yeah. we're shooting for an A-level match, and this is like not, it's, it's a C-level match. Uh, but it, if you think about it, you know, your, your arm on the back and the front is not exactly the same. Your face, you know, and your hand and palms and whatever, you know, you, your skin's not all the same color. So you can get away with it unless you, you want to hide the fact that you've got a seam there. Think about it, the hood and the fender of your car weren't the same exact perfect A-level match. You notice it. So, uh, you have any, any questions? Is this what the bottles look like? Um, I wanted to know, do you have like, a specific amount of weight that that hand itself can carry? Like, mine is a lot. <laughs> Good question. And we're proud to say we took a luggage scale, you know, for weighing your luggage, and made this little apparatus, with a, a lever made out of a big steel pipe, and we hang, oops, we hang up a gripper and hook the, the luggage scale here push down on the pipe until it bottoms out mm -hmm. it's 75 pounds okay. and if it breaks it's not good <laughs> and, and we still have a problem with thumbs breaking and fingers layer adhesion issues you know if you're printing something this tall like like that potato looking thing that we sent around a moment ago mm -hmm. uh, that's got a thousand layers in it and you know if you get a little piece of grit in one layer, you're going to have a flaw that's going to break. Yeah, question. Since you already mentioned the process of like, you know, how the soda bottles were made in the shape and form, what about actually doing that itself? Like, you know, you have the materials, you have the soda bottles, why not just use the same process but create three different little molds that way you can blow hot air and it doesn't make it go so Great hard. idea. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, why not? So you, you got to worry about the mold succumbing to deforming with the temperature right. but you got different temperature sensitivities and so there you go and there's some evidence 
I'm trying to get students to to do some more testing with this, but you've heard of the annealing uh, PLA and heat treating it like you do metal. You want to make a sword, you got to quench it, you know, uh, get it red hot and then quench it a certain way to make uh, a good piece of steel. Um, plastics have the same kind of uh, effect. They are affected by the heat history of the plastic. So when you're trying to recycle plastic and make new filament and then make, you know, print with the, the recycled plastic, it's really tough because the whole history of heating it and cooling it, melting it and whatever has an effect on its properties. Uh, when they're re reusing uh, injection molded parts uh, to, to mold with uh, reground parts, they call it, they hardly ever use more than 10% reground with the original virgin pellets uh, because if you did 100% reground, you wouldn't get good quality. So, yeah. Quick question. You got, uh, so this rivet here, you said it was a uh, piece of filament and flatten it with a uh, soldering iron. Okay. And for something you were putting on somebody to use, you put a screw in there mm -hmm. and you could solder over the top of it with a piece of filament and, mm -hmm. you know, cover up the shiny screw. Mm -hmm. um, but for the things that we take apart a lot, we just use pegs uh, a lot. Okay. <laughs> you were talking about the grip testing and this. As I said, I'm uh, putting together uh, a document which, keep in mind, I am no expert. I'm trying to collect from you experts. Um, but this is a document that I can give you the official reference for, and it's showing the major grips uh, and three different sizes for each of these, so if we can make more of a standardized test, maybe for those that uh, don't have the entire kit that you have, Chad. Yeah. Um, so but yeah, doing. I'm trying to capture the test procedures like you. I wrote down your and lunch We're, we're very interested yeah. in that in our lab too. Let me see. And if that's I can. that's something we're also trying to. I mean, some of these objects that are in that kit, it's like it's very obvious. You know, what what substitutions or clinical substitutions yeah. can be made? Or here we're supposed to have a plastic pair. I don't have one of those at home. I wonder if there's anything else that's that like a, might be more common. That's like a big lot to like, yeah. Hobby Lobby, like one of those stuff. Yeah. 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 So, you know. But it didn't say what size plastic uh, pair either, so I'm trying to get a little more specific on that. Help me with some ideas, folks, and do some experiments. I encourage you to try making adjust, uh, gripper thumbs and adjustable wraps and see if, if, uh, if you can help us to develop it, take it to the next level. Uh, we're still finding thumbs especially breaking and we're trying to find an orientation. If we, if we print the gripper in this orientation, the grains along the, the lines of the fingers and that's least likely to break by bending the fingers. Uh, but there's, my goal is to not use infill or support material. So we try to design things you know, so that you can print them this way, it's domes and things that don't need support inside, uh, <coughs> don't need infill for the structural strength shape like an egg, <laughs> you know, it, it, uh, it's a uh, very strong geometry and uh, so it can be lightweight. I mean, think about it. You're trying to hold that up with your little residual upper arm, you know, if, if you're not real sensitive about trying to minimize the weight of your parts, especially out on the terminal end of it, that's a lot of weight to try to lift. There's a lot of torque on your, your residual limb. So making it as lightweight as possible is, is a goal. So making it hollow is a goal. Also, if you make it hollow, you can use the SLS powdered nylon uh, shape lace to, to print the same STL file. You have to have a hole in it so that you can dump the powder out. We won't be told about that this morning. Uh, but I, I want these designs to be the same STL file to use with uh, shape ways or with your printer. And so one of the, I think it was uh, three, uh, 3D uh, 
Simplify 3D suggested that we rotate it this way <laughs> to try to optimize the, the strength you know, the not having which way. <laughs> so the way I do slices. So, so the so the fenders are, are are kind of like not not this way, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. and so I don't know. I haven't got a good answer yet. But I developed a test. So in addition to pulling down with a uh, and seeing how much weight you can lift, we need to do an impact test. And you see that the plastics videos with. Uh, uh, Tom Sandlatterer and Maker's Muse and, uh, and several others have this whacker, you know, a hammer that swings down with uh, two jewels of force and breaks a, a little thing that's kind of like a finger. So guess what? Our, our next step, uh, I'm going to try to do it in the summer, we didn't make it, but when I'm printing a gripper, I also will print uh, a finger. Mm -hmm. To test and orient it a certain way uh, uh, on the printer along with the one that we're going to use I'll have one to test and destroy and I'll put it in the whacker and see how many uh, uh, joules of energy it absorbs when the hammer hits it whether it breaks or not and, and you can see this one with the changed color of the filament halfway through it the different ways that you can uh, orient it you know to uh, to test, compare the strength, and uh, so we will publish that once we get it sorted out. Maria's been after us to try to come up with uh, test test fixtures and so forth. The STLs for the gripper online. Yes. Fingers. So, fingers, and, and uh, look at those uh, blog posts. That's yeah, the most. If you look at enabling stuff. the future, there's a real nice article introducing mm -hmm. what they've done on here. So. Google adjust a wrap, <laughs> and the group in the tours is one of the uh, blog posts. Any other questions? I'll relinquish the table here. I have a question for you for the model that when we're done. Yeah, okay. For freezing purposes. You bet. You're up then if you want to give uh, the prizes. Okay.